This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. When anatomist Richard Owen proposed the term dinosauria in 1842, the known examples were just a handful of incomplete skeletons unearthed in the early 1800s. Today, there are over a thousand known species. New specimens, the time to study them, and great advances in technology have allowed us a better understanding of the creatures that roamed the Earth millions of years ago. But new finds and fresh analysis can change the way we view these ancient creatures. Our guest today is Gregory Erickson, a professor of anatomy and vertebrate paleobiology at Florida State University and curator at Florida State University's Biological Science Museum, who has played a role in many important discoveries over the years. Professor Erickson, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me. What sparked your interest in biology? Well, I don't know. It probably comes from my father. My father was a a very famous bear biologist. And so I grew up uh, catching bears with him, to be honest with you. So I always had appreciation for nature. Uh, Later in his career, he worked on uh, seals and killer whales. I actually was involved with killer whale part of that. So I've always been into animals. uh, But like most kids, I was also into dinosaurs too. And uh, so, yeah, just kind of all blended together, I guess. Right. And, and as you expand in one area, you get more interested and in, you follow the like, kind of paths that get you where you're going. Moving into the, the dinosaur work a little bit, I would like to first define what tyrannosaurs are as a like genus, I guess, or the, the broader species besides just the T-Rex we know about. What kind of unites them? Yeah, well, tyrannos- tyrannosaurids is, is uh, these are, are very large carnivorous dinosaurs. They had uh, reduced uh, their their fingers down to two main fingers. They had a very robust teeth as adults. Uh, some some aspects of their front teeth uh, that we call premolars that have a D shape to them. Um, some other aspect, minor aspects of the skulls and whatnot. But they were they were clearly the the dominant predators in in the latest Cretaceous. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is kind of the changes in how we look at them over the years. Like, like I was looking at some of the very earliest stuff from the mid 1800s to like dinosaur toys when we were kids that is more upright than it is now. And kind of like the posture has changed. Like what about that for you has really cemented how the views of them shift over time? Yeah. Yeah. When these animals were first found, uh, they were believed to be cold blooded reptiles and all reptiles today that <laughs> drag their tails. So uh, that's kind of the way uh, they were depicted. Uh, slow moving tail draggers, so to speak. All my all my dinosaurs when I was a kid were, were like that. And uh, only only lately have we gotten to uh, to the point where they're they're what we call the uh, teeter totter pose where the tails up in the air. We know and we know that from uh, ossifying structures in their tails that their tails were up up in the air. Uh, but also, we when we find trackways of them, you very rarely ever f- uh, see a tail drag or anything like that. So they've definitely definitely changed. So they went from being tall, or with the T Rex, it went from being like eighteen feet tall down to about twelve feet tall. Um, it's uh, you know, so that that's part of it. And uh, yeah, I mean, d- every you know, every discovery we make about these animals changes changes our perceptions of them. Uh, we we even think that t- you know, Tyrannosaurus rex may have actually had some some feathering of some sort. Mm-hmm. And and that would be kind of something that didn't hold up over time, right? Like you're not finding remnants of that in the mud with the what's fossilized. Yeah, well, the, the preservation of feathers is uh, requires a very uh, specific kind of sedimentology, very fine mm-hmm. sediments, and and so like for instance, in in China, uh, in Liaoning, we have uh, birds and dinosaurs that have. have Basically washed out into into uh, shallow lagoons that had really fine sediment and picked that up and and but it you you look at an animal like Tyrannosaurus rex uh, being buried in river sediments so that's that's a very aggressive river uh, and so the sediment's much more coarse so it's less likely that they're going to show up um, although we do occasionally find feather traces of some other dinosaurs and I think I think down the road um, we may find that 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 some of these tyrannosaurids, including T-Rex, had some feathering. Uh, we know from from uh, skin impressions of T-Rex, it was mostly a scaly animal. The scales mm-hmm. were very small. It kind of looked like a very beady looking, kind of like a, uh, a Gila monster, I guess would be a good way to uh, liken it. Uh, and But if we look at the ancestry of uh, tyrannosaurids and, and, and the ones before, the earlier ones were feathered. The, the, the early ancestors of T-Rex were feathered. Uh, 
and uh, these animals had had feathering, kind of kind of like a kiwi had. It kind of looked like hairs, uh, and certainly for display, and even on the arms as a you know kind of kind of looking like wings. Obviously, they weren't flying, but they were for display as well. So I, I think down the road we probably will find that uh, some of these tyrannosaurids and, and perhaps even T. Rex actually had some sort of uh, feathery integument. Now you you mentioned that they're they kind of adapted to having two claws. Can we talk a little bit about the the little arms? Like, what were they actually using those arms for? I think they were I think they were absolutely useless. I think uh, <laughs> yeah. If we look at early ancestors of the tyrannosaurids, they they had normally proportioned arms, three main fingers, these sorts of things. Uh, then when you get to these uh, great big tyrannosaurids, you know, get thirty, you know, thirty to you know forty three foot long animals, uh, the arms kind of stayed behind. They never got any bigger. In fact, we start seeing them losing one of their fingers. It's, it's certainly vestigial. Uh, I believe that, uh, they were they're basically just vestigial elements that uh, just, just, uh, ele- anatomical structures that weren't being used for their initial purpose. Uh, that doesn't mean they didn't try to, uh, use them for something. We see that with a lot of animals today. I mean, lots of lizards and salamanders uh, have, little vestigial elements. And they'll still try to grapple with them and that sort of thing. But I don't think they really had uh, much of a function in, in a, a tyrannosaur. Uh, also, a lot of tyrannosaur arms are broken. So um, if they had an important function, uh, they could certainly, <laughs> they'd certainly go uh, several months before they could heal again and still make a living. So I, I, I just don't think they were all really doing much of anything. So so one of your, your big claims to fame with the T-Rex was aging Sue. So I, I would like to hear a little bit about this as as somebody who was the right age to be hearing about Sue as she was discovered in all the lawsuits and such. Yeah, that's uh, well, I'll try to give you the short version. Uh, I, I was a Jack Horner's graduate student at Montana State University, a, a, a very famous paleobiologist, and I did my master's with him. And back then, uh, the thought was that uh, we couldn't age a tyrannosaur. And, and there were two problems. When you get a, a big animal like T. Rex, the first of all, the bones are hollowed out, so they're air filled, and that was common of all the carnivorous dinosaurs. And and so when they're as they were growing, their bones became hollower and hollower. Be be like trying to uh, age a tree, but you cord out the middle, so you're li- missing a lot of information. The other thing is with long lived animals, uh, uh, particularly large animals, they remodel their bones too. So. Uh, what happens is, uh, and this happens in humans too, by the time we're 25, you completely remodel your bones. So um, in the case of T-Rex, that ate up a whole bunch of the growth rings. So I remember Jack telling me we'd, we'd never know the age of T-Rex. Um, and so traditionally, people look at the thigh bone, the the, the femur, and cut that. And uh, so it, it just looked like we we're never going to get anywhere. And uh, also, all T. Rexes back then were adults. No one, uh, we had juvenile T. Rexes, but but everybody just thought they were different species. And so, mm-hmm. anyway, what happened is I vid- visited the field museum and I was looking at uh, Sue and some of the other tyrannosaurs. And I realized by looking at when I was looking at the ribs and also uh, the pubis, which is one of the uh, hip bones, uh, I realized I, c- I could see all the growth rings. And these are bones that are not hollowed out in these carnivorous dinosaurs. And, I re- and, and on day one, I, I countered it up and I said, I believe Sue's about 27. And I was just with a, just with a hand lens. Uh, I, uh, ultimately, I, I found it was 28. Uh, but Pretty I close. <laughs> so I showed that to the curators and uh, I was really excited, obviously. No one had ever aged something like that. Uh, and uh, I had to work with the with the field museum for about six months, uh, trying to convince them to let me cut up some of these uh, pieces of this eight point six three million dollar dinosaur, uh, and eventually they 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 decided it was it was worth a try. And uh, you got to understand when you mount a, a big dinosaur skeleton like that, there's often pieces that don't go into the mount, and those are the ones that I targeted. Uh, and uh, yeah, so basically, I, I figured out it was about twenty eight years of age. Uh, I called it was, uh, so Sue was, re- was, was known for being really beat up, uh, lots of injuries and that sort of thing. And I was stunned at how young it was. So, uh, when I went into that research, p- people believe that, uh, based on, on, on scaling it as a cold blooded reptile, it would have been about 200 years of age. Uh, other people, some of my other colleagues, a little more extreme were saying, well, dinosaurs are, or birds are dinosaurs. And therefore maybe it grew up in a year and a half or something like that, which I didn't think mm-hmm. was possible. Uh, and anyway, 
Uh, and then an elephant, uh, th- those animals, you know, a, a full grown elephant's about, you know, 60, 70 years. I thought that's where it was going to be. I was surprised it was just 28. Uh, and so because of its injuries and how young it was, I, I basically uh, dubbed T-Rex the, the James Dean of dinosaurs. Here's, you know, it, it lived fast and it died young. And that, that really resonated with the press. So uh, anyway, it was a really exciting study. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, and, and the, so I, I knew that. And then I took three or four more years. Uh, I decided that wasn't a good enough question. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I teamed up with some of my colleagues from the Field Museum, the American Museum, the Field, and uh, 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 the Chiro Museum, and we cut up subadults of T. Rex and figured out its growth curve. And so T. Rex was growing at about uh, five and a half pounds per day, uh, which, which which shows the Atkins diet doesn't work, by the way. Uh, <laughs> So again, that wasn't enough for me. So I decided, well, how did T-Rex get so big? And so, uh, so we we went and sampled a whole bunch of uh, uh, close relatives of T-Rex, like Gorgosaurus and Albertosaurus, and established their growth curves. And from that, we were able to show that how T-Rex became a giant. It essentially just grew at explosive rates uh, during its teenage years, uh, and that's been pretty much found throughout the dinosauria as well. So anyway. Uh, I think it was like three studies wrapped up into one, but uh, it's just just it's getting the way I am. I just uh, take things a little too far, maybe. Well, or just the curiosity doesn't end when you just have some of the answer. There's always going to be so many more things to know about. Yeah. We, you know, what's funny, Nate is uh, so I worked on the aging uh, Sue for about two years before I really thought I had it. And so you're the first. You know, the great thing about science is, is you're the first person in the history of the planet. To know that factoid, and you work so hard at it, spend a lot of money, that sort of thing. And what do you do? You immediately run next door and tell your neighbor, and, so on, and then you publish paper. And the whole world knows about it. So for a minute there, you're like the only person who knows something that's really cool. But uh, I, that, that's the excitement of science, I guess. And um, but I, I remember doing that though, running down the hall and telling them, "I'm like, oh, there you go. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, check out this thing you didn't know before. Like, it's cool to everyone knows. new discoveries, man." Um, it was a lot of fun. What kind of what br- brought us to this conversation today was a paper you were involved with with Gorgosaurus, and they found an intact stomach. Is that rare to find an intact stomach in general? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It was. Uh, we found the stomach contents of this this animal, uh, and so I, there's only a handful of uh, dinosaurs where the stomach contents contents are really well preserved usually in cases where a small carnivorous dinosaur ate a whole animal and that kind of thing uh for tyrannosaur ids these these big tyrannosaurs this is a gorgosaurus so the adult would have been about uh three thousand kilograms it would have been about 10 meters long that that and, and for those animals we occasionally find little pieces of bone that are pulverized in their in their stomach cavities uh so this was a a really small uh juvenile gorgosaur i aged it at about six years of age uh and it was uh maybe four meters in length 300 kilograms uh so a a, a, a tyrannosaur uh, a young tyrannosaur like that is really rare incredibly rare and this one's really well preserved and then to find the stomach contents in there is just it, i mean these are the best stomach contents in any tyrannosaur ever uh which is really exciting uh it's i, I liken it to uh i don't know Finding the crown jewels in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. It's like, wow, it's all, it's just unbelievable. And uh, so uh, just a remarkable fossil. Uh, and it really opened up uh, or basically answered some questions about what juvenile tyrannosaurs were doing. So a juvenile tyrannosaur uh, had, uh, was a very gracile animal, uh, kind of more like a raptor, I guess, in some sense than a, you know, big T-Rex kind of looking animal. Uh and they had very, very uh, uh, slender teeth, blade-like teeth, um, and uh, so it, it just didn't have very robust skulls or anything like that. So we know the adults pulverized bone. We know that from uh, fecal matter called coprolites, and then a few uh, tyrannosaur, adult tyrannosaurs with broken bones that we found around their stomachs. Uh, and so it was a huge mystery as to who filled in the uh, kind of middle niches in... in um, Cretaceous ecosystems. Uh, basically, up to about 300 kilograms, we have all kinds of raptors and uh, other kind of carnivorous animals. And then nothing, just juvenile T. rex uh, 
uh, going all the way up to the full size ones. And so the theory was that these animals must maybe were filling in this niche and feeding upon uh, different prey than the adults. Um, and so this is the first uh, empirical evidence showing that that was truly the case. I think every spring, these little dinosaurs uh, called uh, citipes, uh, or, or bit, little uh, omnivorous turkey-sized animals were running around. They would have lots of young. These animals had 20 or 30 eggs. So there were lots of young hatching out. Very few of them are going to make it to adult size. And this, these uh, young gorgosaurs were more than happy to see that that was not the case. Uh, and then the other thing that was really stunning about that is uh, I would have thought that the Tyrannosaur would have eaten these animals in their entirety. Uh, that's what Komodo dragons do. That's what crocodiles do. But instead, uh, what we found is just the hind legs. Uh, so basically, it wasn't just a snapshot of this Gorgosaurs, uh, you know, dying on that one day uh, from the stomach contents. We had a kind of view as to what it was up to the last couple of weeks, and so it, the, the, there were hind limbs of two of these small um, citipes, uh in, in its uh, stomach region. Uh, one was much more digested than the other, um, pitted with stomach acid. And very few animals can digest bone, by the way. We knew tyrannosaurs could do it, and these young ones could do it as well. Um, so it basically told us, uh, and then it was it was literally uh, focusing on the the best parts of these animals. It was probably gutted the animal, tore off its legs, and moved on. Uh, and so that that was that was a, a real shocker to me. And I was really happy that they, uh, the Royal Tyrrell Museum and the well, University of Calgary, asked me to come in and help out with that project. Can you tell us where that sample was found? Where was where did that fossil come from? Like what part of the world were? Yeah, this was found uh, in dinosaur. The specimen was found in Dinosaur Provincial Park, uh, which is in Alberta. And it's about uh, oh, maybe a hundred miles uh, west of Calgary. Uh, it's incredible badlands out there, and it was found in the park by uh, Darren Tanky, who is a uh, one of their uh, technicians, and uh, he found the specimen uh, in '09, and I think in '0. And they, they actually were able to brought it in the museum. And as he was preparing it, he noticed these bones in the stomach region and he slowed down. That's why it took so long to get this out. And so he very meticulously worked through it to try to figure out what was going on here. Uh, and then about 012, I saw the specimen and then I was asked to come help out, try to figure out the ages of the, uh, the age of the Gorgosaurus, the, the, tr the young Tyrannosaur, which is about six years of age, and then also uh, help identify and age these uh juvenile uh, creatures that are eaten so uh it's really exciting and uh, uh the plans are that that'll probably go on display at some point so the public can enjoy it as well it being in alberta kind of lends us into leads us into some other work that you've done in alaska and looking at the kind of arctic dinosaurs and one of the questions that came to my mind is is kind of what were those environments like at the time like were they as snowy as we think of them today Matt Druckenmiller is the director of the uh, Alaska Museum of the North, and uh, I'm from Alaska, so I've always wanted to work up in Alaska. And so we teamed up to study uh, dinosaurs that were found in the Prince Creek Formation. This is right up on the Ar uh, Beaufort Sea, essentially the Arctic Ocean, uh, along the Colville River. And dinosaurs have been known there since the uh, well, they've been found. They were found in the late '60s, but they thought they were woolly mammoth bones, and ultimately uh, about. Oh, 12 years later, somebody realized they were dinosaurs. Uh, and so we, we've we been mounting expeditions uh, that are NSF funded now for uh, about 12 years. And uh, to try to figure out how these animals made a living uh, up in the Arctic. And uh, back then it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like it is today. It's obviously a very cold environment. But it's not a place you would expect to find uh, dinosaurs. Uh, we tend to think of dinosaurs as being from tropical environments or uh basically uh, you know, desert kind of environments along the equator and these sorts of things. So get basically warm environments. Right. Uh, it was more, and, and some of our analyses have shown that it was about, the mean annual temperature was about 54 Fahrenheit, uh, which is equivalent to Juneau, Alaska, uh, which isn't a place you go if you want to go look for turtles and snakes and lizards today. <laughs> so, uh, it was a cold, it was a cold environment. It definitely snowed on these animals. We have evidence for that. And also, uh, they would have experienced about four or five months of absolute complete polar darkness. So uh, we dove into this project uh, looking at this as a uh, 
wonderful natural test of dinosaur uh, physiology. So there were theories that the dinosaurs up there uh, were actually from Alberta, the same species from Alberta and Montana, and that they would make 3,000 mile treks back and forth, uh, you know, to escape the cold, but take advantage of the uh, floral uh, you know, bloom that it would occur uh, each spring and summer. So that was, you know, and, and also, but, but the, the alternative to that was that maybe they were up there year round. So this is the coldest environment in the Cretaceous period. These are the most Northern dinosaurs uh, known. So 85 degrees North. I mean, they were up there with Santa Claus. Uh, <laughs> so they were, they were basically uh, ex- exposed to an environment you wouldn't expect. And what we found is they were actually nesting up there. And so in fact, almost every species up there uh, was nesting up there. So they were there year round. Now, how they pulled that off is the next question. And so that'll be the topic of our next grant, honestly. Uh, and what's really interesting is we're, we're, what we find up there, we find birds, uh, we find mammals, we have find dinosaurs. We know birds and mammals are warm-blooded. So I think it's some of the strongest evidence that the dinosaurs were definitively warm-blooded animals. Uh, they definitely weren't migrating. So they're up there year-round. Um, what they ate in the winter, I have no idea. The... Um, uh, most of the trees were deciduous, and so they would have – all the foliage would have – all their leaves would have been shed. So uh, how they made a living, I have no idea. And so that's what we're trying to figure out. And the other, the other cool thing is – or I, I think it's interesting at least – is that everything we're finding up there, the mammals and uh, the birds and the dinosaurs are all new species. So we've argued that we've discovered a lost world of dinosaurs. Uh, in other words, no one – Everyone just thought these were the same dinosaurs from uh, Alberta and Montana. That's not what we're finding. So uh, we feel that these were uh, basically uh, animals that were adapted for the Arctic conditions back then. And so uh, it's it's really been exciting uh, you know, working up there. So, but uh, there's more to come. <laughs> so. Can you tell us a little bit about the specific species, I guess, or the kinds of dinosaurs you're finding there? The dinosaurs we're finding up in the uh, Cretaceous Arctic of Alaska are uh, are really interesting. We we have uh, a tyrannosaur called Nanuksaurus. Uh, we have several duckbill dinosaurs. One of them we named called uh, Grunelik cookbakensis. Uh, we actually go to the the uh, Nanukiad elders and ask them what they would call it. So we let them name our dinosaurs. So uh, and uh, that's a neat name. It it, it means uh, ancient grazer of the Kukpik, which is the Colvin River. So it just means ancient gra- a- ancient grazer of the Colvin River is what it means. So anyway, um, we have a giant raptor up there of some sort. We're trying to figure out what that is. Uh, we got a bunch of small raptors. Uh, we have uh, ostrich dinosaurs, uh, beaked creatures. So, And uh, we discovered a little tiny horned dinosaur uh, called Leptoceratops that's uh, certainly going to be a new species. We got a bunch of stuff to name here. Uh, then there's uh, at least one horned dinosaur called Pachyrhinosaurus that had a big ugly boss on its nose and that sort of thing. So, um, so just uh, we went into this. We it was it really wasn't known what was up there. Uh, it was known that there was a Pachycephalosaur, a little piece of, of one of those was found. There it was understood there was a duckbill dinosaur and a horned dinosaur, probably a tyrannosaur and that sort of thing. But our work has has uh, revealed uh, just thousands of new materials and that sort of thing to the point where we can hone in on what these animals really are. Like I said before, people just thought these were just scraps of animals that lived down in Alberta and Montana, and that's not what we're finding. Uh, so it was a, it was a uh, shockingly much richer environment uh, or community than we ever realized. And that it, it's not just the dinosaurs. It's uh, so the, the dinosaur community there matches what we're seeing down in uh the low, the, you know, the lower 48 and, and into Alberta as well. Uh, it was a very rich uh, environment, but uh, it extends over to the fish that we're finding up there, uh, the mammals and the birds. They, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of new species up there. Uh, so it was, it was just, uh, like I said, it was a lost, lost world that we just never re- really realized. So uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's really exciting uh, field work. It's, it's pretty, uh, it's expensive and difficult research to do, but I, I really enjoy getting back to back to Alaska because that's where I'm from initially anyway. So. And having that lifelong connection to biology in Alaska, how does it feel to be discovering unknown creatures? It's incredible. <laughs> it's, well, it's really exciting when you, 
uh, find dinosaur remains, uh, typically just find little scraps and that sort of thing. Once in a while you get lucky, you'll see a bone coming out of the hill and you'll dig in and realize you have a skeleton. That in and of itself is really exciting. Uh, honestly, when we find things in the field, we, we're, we're not exactly sure what we're looking at. And, and uh, if you do it right, you'll you'll jack it up these fossils and bring them, bring them back. And you won't realize whether you have a, a, a new species or not for you know a year or two until it gets prepared and that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's very much like we discussed with the, uh, the Gorgosaur discovery up in Alberta. It, 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 took, it took several years for them to realize that they had something really, really special in that case. And that's kind of the case with us too. Special thanks to Gregory Erickson. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Podker. You can watch a video version of this conversation on our YouTube and Roku channels by searching at NSF Science. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at NSF.gov.